please um, welcome our uh, speaker, Jean Louis Horvillier. Uh, and let me briefly introduce him. And he received his bachelor's degree with focus of soil science and horticulture from Texas Tech University, a winemaker certification from Texas Tech University as well. And he will be graduating from Rockhurst University in 2023. Uh, where he's studying his MBA with a concentration on management from Hulsberg School of Business. He has been working in the wine industry since 2016 and also with Terravox Winery since the spring of 2019, where he will be sharing his projects from this uh, winery. Uh, he's both a winemaker and vineyard manager for Terravox and will further advance his wine education in pursuing the WSET. Work with owner of Terravox, Jerry Esterhold. Uh, to oversee and conduct this specific share farmers ranchers project. Please welcome Jean Louis. Thank you. Hello, can y'all hear me okay? Okay, so I'm Jean, nice to meet you guys. Having a good Friday so far? Great, great. Uh, so like he said, what we did was we investigated the biodynamic production of American horticulture grapes. Um, so we'll just jump right in. So this is Terravox. This is the winery and vineyard that I work at. Um, right over here in this area, this is what I like to call the Genesis plot. So that was the winery and vineyard was, or the vineyard was founded in 1996 by uh, owner and proprietor, Jerry Eisterhold. Um, so this is kind of where it all started. Uh, but even before that, it started back with Thomas Walney Munson and his work with Phylloxera. Raise your hand if you know what Phylloxera is. No? Okay, yes. Uh, so essentially, phylloxera was this disease that hit the, it was a plight that hit uh, Europe and uh, I think primarily French vineyards. And um, he found out when you take American rootstock and graft to uh, European vines, you get this immunity to the disease. Uh, lucky for us, he was this awesome grape breeder. I think he bred over, I'm forgetting the number, over 200 different American varietals. Um, so that's kind of where it all starts, of course, with uh, other help with Charles Valentine Riley and Friedrich Munch and George Hussman. It's kind of like the founding father, so to speak, of where we've kind of taken off and uh, ran with. Um, so I like to say that if prohibition did not happen, there would be a chance that, you know, it's arguable that these grapes could be as popular or as commercially known as your Malbecs, your your Pinots, your Cabernets. Um, so what we do is just specialize uh, completely on these American heritage grapes. So it's kind of like the background. I can I can do a whole presentation on just what we do alone. But uh, so in, in, in general, this area right here was planted in 96 and you can kind of see these little outlines. This is all Norton. So we primarily plant Norton in that section. And then also in this section right here, and this entire section right there is Wetumpka. So Wetumpka and Norton are the two grapes that we primarily focused on for this investigation. And go ahead and jump right in. Okay, so uh, the investigation the, the idea was we want to lower input of sprays, uh, lower input in the environmental impacts, tractors, emissions, and stuff like that, um, and as well as celebrate the diversity and generate this diversity with positive outcomes. Um, so the, the focus was how do we limit our input with still with, and at the same time still maintain this positive uh, quality to the grape. So as I said before, Norton, brief little characteristics. Um, it makes this really nice and inky wine. Um, later, I'll show you the different styles of wine that we make, but it's very productive in terms of foliage. Um, medium fir firm clusters, really dark berries. Um, it does require cane pruning, so as opposed to spur pruning. So it's a little bit more tedious during this time of the season. But once we get to the point where we're starting to focus on the other grapes, oh, I didn't say this, uh, we have about 60 different varietals of these grapes. So logistically, there's a lot to do. Um, so it's just this dialogue with the grapes, so to speak. Um, 
for the wine characteristics, you get this medium acidity. It's somewhere in the world of uh, sort of like a Merlot, like a Italian reds, if you can kind of picture that. Um, it does undergo malolactic fermentation, so we do want that um, uh, aspect to the wine. Um, we make a red rosé, a port, and a pet nat, and the potential, the aging potential is really nice. Uh, I found that aging in barrel or aging in bottle or just, uh, you know, how, however long it takes, it, it wine's a living thing, right? So it's always changing, uh, but it's a very nice, pretty wine. Watumka, it's, uh, so the unique thing about Watumka, besides all those characteristics, it is this very floppy foliage. So it wants to go down, it, it air roots. So all in the cordon, you'll actually see some roots actually establishing. Um, but once you walk into the vineyard on harvest day, you get this huge whiff of elderberry flowers. It's just like citrus and tropical notes. It's just like this awesome grape. One of the downfalls is uh, the grapes, if I were to look at them the wrong way or the wrong wind hits on harvest day, they just shatter. They completely come apart. So whenever we're picking, we put our bins underneath and uh, try to collect all the fallen ones. But once it's ready to be picked, it has to be picked. Otherwise, the wind will... Um, force them to fall. Um, besides that, it does have a really nice, um, really, it's probably by volume our most popular white wine that we have. So the two volumes, the two highest and probably our most popular, that's why we chose these two grapes specifically. Um, and so the picture that I showed you before, the, the pretty picture of the vineyard, this is the first half. So this was planted in 96 and these were planted in 2000s. So we wanted to focus on the west block and we took two rows of Wetumpka and two rows of Norton. And we decided to put choose those two rows specifically because if we're gonna quit spraying, then we have to uh, sort of create like a buffer zone with the surrounding rows. So that way, if we wanna spray this section of Wetumpka, we can judge by how far the tractor um, the, the sprayer sprays, and based on how far it gets to our best ability, we try to cut the spraying off completely. So that was the intention of the two areas. And I mean, you can kind of, it's hard to compare how those two rows perform compared to the other lots because of the micro uh, climates and other reasons. But um, yeah, we'll just continue. So, um, the very first thing we did after we agreed to pursue this biodynamic um, endeavor, we wanted to see the baseline of what the soil is like. So background, the soil is low soil. Um, it has a healthy range overall. So the range of hydrogen compared to the hydroxyl ions, there is a percentage, a, a good percentage that we can uptake the nutrients. So that's, that was nice. In general, the, the soil is very nice. Um, like most places, I would guess, phosphorus is pretty low. Phosphorus is hard to maintain, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that's the job of uh, mycorrhizal fungi that can help produce phosphorus. Otherwise, you're fertilizing and you know taking uh, phosphate and actually applying that. The problem with that is that phosphorus is not as mobile, um, but that's certainly something we wanted to keep our eye on. And in general, Magnesium, calcium, potassium, um, and also nitrogen was relatively high. Um, so we figured that this is about what the range of how much we needed to apply in the vineyard below. So like I said before, we started with the test, uh, with the soil test, and we did that through University of Missouri. Um, so we started with the compost pile. And so what I did was I went to our neighbors to have horses. I collected a bunch of horse manure, put it in the back of our gator and added a bunch of green trimmings and some brown stuff and wanted to create this like healthy compost um, to apply back into the vineyard to kind of compensate a little bit for those lacking nutrients that we may or may not have. And the next step was we seeded Kentucky bluegrass, snow pea, red and white clover and put that in between the rows. Um, so not underneath the trellis itself, but in between the rows where the tractor would be uh, going through. And we did it with that little machine right there. We put the seeds and mixed it up in a bin and we just went ahead and did that. And we added our compost. Um, so the camping management, something that we noticed coming through 
was we did pick up powdery mildew, as you can see right here. So it's not in the best condition comparable to everything else, but it's something that you would expect with cutting off spring completely. So I like to think of it as a sort of like a organic shock, right? Um, so these are kind of the pictures that we saw. The other thing too, with the interseeding of the different types of uh, ground coverage, you notice with the weeding, it became very laborious to maintain um, uh, trimming up the, the, you know, the area where all the weeds grow. So about two or three times that season, we took a weed whacker and just try to eliminate the best possible. Um, so that is one thing that we create uh, notice as well as the canopy being significantly denser. So like I was saying before, this is kind of just some numbers of how long it took for the biodynamic areas, the two rows per varietal. Um, I like to show this just to show kind of like how much time goes in between it. And then for the Wetumpka, about the same. Um, obviously with the cane pruning, it takes a little bit more time than the spur pruning. Um, anybody here familiar with cane pruning? So essentially at the beginning of, so you have your trunk and then you have your two cordons. And with spur pruning um, on the trunk or on the cordon, these spurs will produce about ideally fist apart. And the idea is to establish a zone where the new growth can uh, grow. So you have the, your grapes growing in that fruit zone. So instead of doing that, cane pruning, we take the first two uh, bull canes at the beginning of the cordon, we lop off everything else, and we just recreate a new cordon every single year. So it could be a little bit time consuming. It takes a little bit more zip ties, and we have to do it when it's about this weather. So we're currently cane pruning and spur pruning right now in the season. But uh, bud thinning took a little bit less time, and most of this labor was done between one to two people uh, at any given time. So as harvest was coming, uh, I usually take bricks, pH, and titratable acidity. So bricks is just a unit of sugar, uh, how we measure how sweet the, the grape is, and in turn, what the alcohol percentage will be. pH uh, helps us maintain sulfites and how to keep everything uh, clean in the cellar, as well as you know, plays, a well, um, uh, plays a part with acid. I didn't put the titratable acidity here because I typically won't, I'll test it every now and again, like as we get closer, just to have an idea of how acidic the grapes are. But for these purposes, I did not mention it. Um, but yeah, let's just look at, so right here on August 11th, um, Wetumpka is typically harvested in September. So this is, you know, kind of getting up to that point. So as we're approaching, or as we're in Verasion, changing color and uh, establishing more sugar and more acid into the grapes, you can kind of see comparatively how it's gone down and how it's, or how it's increased rather. And then um, harvesting Norton in August is pretty much an impossibility. It's just, it's just not even, it's still green at that point. So you can kind of see the progression of um, the numbers. Um, so one of the notes that I, I wrote down was the non-biodynamic Norton uh, had this acidity watermelon, herbaceous, and tart, which would make sense because it still hasn't, you know, completed its version. And it's, it's, it's hard to answer this question. Subjective, wine can be so subjective as well as the grapes, because if I think something's great and you don't think it's great, where do we, where do we kind of meet? But in general, these were the tasting notes that we came up with the sampling for the grapes. Um, one thing I'll, as a prelude, Watumpka was very similar. So keep that, keep that in mind. So harvest, I hope these pictures can be bigger. So um, in general, the grapes for Norton were kind of raisinated, raisinated um, a little desiccated, a little bit of PM, but the fruit quality was amazing. It tasted really, really nice. Um, it took a little bit of time to sort out just because the weeds were so heavy and the canopy was so so lush. Um, mind you, this was back in 2020. So this was still, and we're trying to figure out what this experiment would be like. And I won't spend too much time on this section, but in general, we, after harvest, we ended up taking more, uh, I guess like halfway through this point in time, we took 
note of where the soil was at and what the situation was. And back again in January of 2021. So starting the new year, preparing for next year's harvest. Um, so we did have a good uh, level of pH where we could retain our nutrients that help affect phosphorus and potassium, um, potassium as well. So one of the things I found unique with potassium is we had good levels of potassium, but that translocation from uh, soil, the root uptake into the actual plant, um, it, was, it just wasn't there. It wasn't, it, there wasn't much of that going on. So the idea was, well, how do we maintain that potassium to get into the plant and also get into the fruit? So that's something like these buffer things that help aid that. That's, that's one of the things that we discovered with this. Um, phosphorus, again, relatively low. Um, and it did decrease as we went along. Organic matter, we don't want the organic matter to be incredibly high. We, we like the level that it's, that it's at. Um, and then the cation exchange. So the ability to maintain um, and hold the nutrients. So we saw that number and we were pretty pleased with that number. So we've now harvested the grapes, all the fruit is in, it's getting weighed and thrown into the crusher to stemmer. Uh, so once it's been crushed and processed, we took these original numbers. So for the pH, for the biodynamic, that's a really good number. We know that the pH is gonna increase when it spends its time in the cellar. The Brooks is also pretty nice, 23.5. So it's gonna have an ample level of alcohol. So ageability, uh, complexity. So that was one, one of the nice things. The TA was a little bit high. Uh, we were hoping for somewhere in the nine range. Um, so essentially what we wanted to do, but for the sake of the experiment, we did not add any tartaric acid. Um, but the alcohol percentage was at a good range, 12.7%. Roughly you wanted to do 0.605 to get to what you expect the alcohol to be, but there are indissolvable sugars that are there. Uh, biodynamic Watumka was very low in terms of, uh, oh, I got those numbers switched around. The BRICS was 16 and the pH was 3.09. Now the pH of 3.09 is relatively low, but it's not concerning because I know it's gonna rise. Um, but the pH of 16 is low. That's really low, um, you know, so I think the TTB recognizes wine at 7% alcohol. So if it goes below 7%, is it not wine anymore? So yeah, one of those deals. Um, so the way I made the red, I wanted to make it as, you know, so going back to the original picture of the vineyard, we have the Norton East block that was planted in 96, the center block 2000, and the area that we conducted the experiment was on the west block. So in general, the east block, we would take that fruit, process it down and separate that portion to make rosé. So we make a sunny and a sunny slope. And whatever's left from that portion, we, it, which is like this thicker must that doesn't have a ton of juice in it, but it does macerate nicely and gets this inkier color. Uh, we couldn't do that with this side of the experiment. So lot two and lot three, so the center block and the west block, we did an open bin fermentation post uh, crush and press. What's that? And we did about two or three punch downs a day um, to break up that cap and make sure we have a pretty wine. And once we pressed it, we went ahead and uh, added malolactic bacteria to it or uh, lactic bacteria to it. And we went ahead with the malolactic fermentation. After that, we typically add about 50 to 70 parts per million of SO2 just as a baseline. And we're pretty much maintaining 25 to 35 parts of SO2, which is relatively low. Um, after that, we polish it with a K100 um, filter membrane, and then we sterile filter it with 0.45 microns and then off to the bottling. Uh, pretty much the same thing with the biodynamic crush. And with the white wine, this year, we a little bit of a different direction with our white wine protocol. Um, so essentially the same thing, crush, and then we went ahead and pressed. And that juice that we maintained, we went ahead and cold settled it for about 24 hours, added bentonite to get the clarity nicely. Um, and then the non-biodynamic wine, we split it up into two lots. One was gonna be fermented on the skins to create this sort of orange wine, but that was destined to be a white port where the other section was used as a control. And then comparatively, the other lot, the biodynamic lot, 
Um, same thing as I mentioned before, minus the port. So my wine consultant, is his name is Clark Smith. Uh, he's a brilliant guy. He wrote the book on postmodern winemaking. I'm sure I have a lot more accolades to, to mention, but we'll just leave it at that. Um, I sent him a bunch of samples that would confuse me, confuse him. So he, there was no way of us knowing what he actually received. And once I put the deciphering paper together, this is what we found. So remember I talked about a little bit of the, the powdery mildew, some of the, you know, some of the faults in the grapes that come with the non-spring. Being that, be, that being a concern, we wanted to see what it would be like with wine. And he actually gave the biodynamic, the double gold grading versus the other ones, which I found unique because that's kind of what you would hope to expect. And because we conducted this experiment within a year, it's impossible to kind of show how much progression the soil or the plants or any other factors within that time a lot. You know, if we wanted to do this completely scientifically, I think we would need more years to kind of go through that. But this was, this was a very surprise, surprising discovery. Um, as I mentioned before, not a ton of difference between these two. Now, mind you, uh, when we take the Wetumpka and we approach bottling date, we like to have a little bit of residual sweetness. So this is just the driest version of it. And the reason why we like residual sweetness with it is because it gives so much more vibrancy and complexity and just a tiny bit of sugar just gives us this kind of um, reminiscence of what it's like to walk out to the vineyard when you get the grapes uh, at harvest. Um, but I will say, uh, unbiasedly that the biodynamics seem to be a hairline better. Um, I think the only difference between the similarity in taste was the alcohol percentage. I wanna say the biodynamic was somewhere in the range of 8.6 alcohol where the Wetumpka control was like below that. I wanna say by almost a point, I think it was 7% alcohol. So the takeaways, um, less labor, that's nice. We like to work less. Uh, less inputs, which is also nice. Uh, the quality of fruit. Um, looking back from 2020's harvest to 2021 and this past harvest of 2022, there has been a slight decline in the yields. However, what we've seen from 2021 and 2022, the quality is getting better. The wine is getting better. Um, so there's that. And then, like I mentioned before, you do have the higher percentage of powdery mildew or anthracnose or black rot, but essentially you're still getting that cleaner fruit. Um, the other thing was the dense canopy in the weeds. That's something that's kind of hard to work around. Um, now, the other thing I'd like to mention is for this to be truly a biodynamic wine, uh, now, we, we couldn't add commercial yeast. We couldn't temperature control. We'd have to get Demeter certified. Um, so that's partly why uh, Jerry Eisterhold, if I can go back, it's partly why we uh, called it ethnobotanical, kind of creating our own kind of brand with us, sort of. Um, so that's one thing that came out of it was just like this, you know, there is a responsibility that we want to give. But I think one of the biggest epiphanies that we had post-experiment was Going back to what Thomas Volney, Thomas Volney Munson said, so besides being a great breeder and you know, saving the French vineyards from Phylloxera, he was also a philosopher. And he talked a lot about dynamic agriculture. And I think it, there are a lot of similar, similarities with his philosophy, philosophy and what biodynamic is uh, aiming to do. So I was speaking to Jerry, and wanted to get his his thoughts on on this kind of thing because you know we give a presentation and it's very lengthy and there's different categories that we want to be able to tackle and this is something that we've been recently fixing up the past few months and talking about it it's just dynamic agriculture it's not a fixed thing um, it's not static it's open ended it's a dialogue with the grapes um, as I walk into the vineyard and I'm noticing things. Like in harvest, for example, um, I can test the bricks, I can test the pH, I can test the titrable acidity, but when I taste the grapes, you know, you, you, you get feelings, what are your thoughts, and what does it taste like, and 
you know, what kind of uh, mouthfeel am I getting? I'm trying to think about everything. Um, the numbers could be right, but if it doesn't taste quite right, what I would imagine the wine to be like, then I might wait a day or I might harvest sooner. Um, so I like these two quotes that Jerry had found. Um, uh, kind of backpacking of what I said earlier, it's non-transactional, but dialogue with the grapes and it's very systemic. So it's a long-term fit between genetics, environment, and culture. Culture mainly because we get at the winery when we get visits, whether someone's from Napa or from Kansas City proper, or you know someone from Texas or even Minnesota. Uh, one of the things that we keep getting asked is, you know, do you spray pesticides? Do you spray spray Roundup? And as much as we don't want to spray those things, when it comes down to it, um, if we have Japanese beetles coming in and they're going to wipe out our entire canopy. Uh, do you let them do what they have to do or do you act and try to, you know, sustain, you know, you know, we all have to eat too, right? So there's this, this systematic approach of how we want to create it. And because there are no endpoints um, with this, it's something that's going to continually go on it's about the, the drive, so to speak, not the destination. But um, as we say, we're going to continue to write the book on this. Uh, so as I was mentioning earlier, of Norton, the red grape, we make three different styles of red. Uh, in 2020, we made a pet nat, a sparkling wine, and two rosés, one port, and now the ethnobotanical. So as a result of this experiment, what's nice about having a small lot, usually about 20 to 40 gallons, uh, depending on the, on the harvest year, it does make a great impact in our catalog of what we can offer folks. And one of the things that, excuse me, one of the things that we're nationally recognized for our Norton is what we don't do to it. So for example, if I'm taking my Norton and I want to age it, I'm not going to put it in this brand new French barrel and, you know, get the coconut and the spice notes. I want it to be in a neutral oak. I want it to be as, um, so I like to say I'm not the pianist nor the piano. I'm the piano tuner and Teravox in Latin, voice of the land. I'm just really trying to give the grape and the wine the voice, not you know, anything outside of that. So that's one of the beautiful things that we got out of the ethnobotanical experiment, uh, as well as with the Wetumpka, make a white wine, a uh, white port. And we discovered a barrel of wine that was, um, it had a massive amount of headspace in it and it had enough booze in it to the point where it kind of tasted like a sherry. So we're trying to recreate that. Um, and then finally the ethnobotanical Wetumpka. So yeah, any questions? Great. Uh, yeah. So just. So what were your principal practices? Oh, okay. So eliminating spraying, uh, interseeding, interseeding uh, seeds, the green clover, white clover, snow pea, and Kentucky bluegrass, uh, adding compost, and the hopes what were if we can improve our nutrient management, then the smaller micronutrients can we kind of pull together and fight this immunity to some of the diseases that might be across. And as we learned, that was something that's harder to mitigate. So does that answer your question? Yeah, so you, you mentioned the field spray that you did the, the 500 and the 501. Yeah, so if we go back uh, to this section. So these two rows in yellow, we sprayed, but when it came to spraying, pretty much the length of the sprayer, if it were to hit, say, four rows, we'd stop spraying those four rows as a buffer to make sure. But of course, with wind drift and other folks around us, um, you know, what do you do about that? So we did it to our best ability. And there was a significant difference between the neighboring vines versus those two, those two rows. So we could see where you know, uh, powdery mildew was not a factor deeper into Wetumpka, whereas those rows were affected by it. Yeah. I'll, I'll send you an email. Cool. I'll send you some other cool stuff on, on some stuff. On Excellent. Great. Thank you. Jen, I'm just interested to know, you know, moving forward, what's the um, future plan for, for Terra Hawks? 
So for Teravox, um, as soon as we submitted the send button to send this these results off, uh, Jerry and I took the gator, drove down this little road and kind of thinking about what we were wanting to do for the upcoming harvest, we were saying, oh, we should expand it to two more rows. And then we started getting crazier and like, let's just do the whole block. And to the point where we're like, well, let's take the entire west side and go biodynamic with it. Um, that's still something that we're curious to do and that we're aiming to do. But, um, and this isn't being a martyr, but being a winemaker, being a vineyard manager, you know, there's also excise taxes. There's also what does marketing look like? And we're a small, small crew. So we really want to do what's best for the vineyard, but also what makes sense economically. So we certainly do want to continue this biodynamic um, endeavor, uh, especially if it makes higher quality wine. We'll keep that going too, because good wine makes the world go around. I, I was also a bit late. So where is your vineyard, please? Yeah, so Teravox uh, is about 30 minutes from downtown Kansas City, uh, about 15 minutes from Weston and Zenerosa, and about 15 minutes from the airport. Um, rolling Green, oh, uh, you probably didn't see this picture. It's really so. close here, yeah. So that's the actual vineyard, yeah. Oh. So the... I just have a question about biodynamic versus organic. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so you said you had powdery mildew and you can spray copper, which is organically certified, but when you're calling it biodynamic, are you not able to even spray an organic <clears throat> material? That is something I have been curious about. Like what, what's the wiggle room with organic sprays to still qualify as a biodynamic um, name but like I, I mentioned before that we didn't we're not as of right now we're not searching to get Demeter certified which is a certification for biodynamic but um you know copper is a tricky thing because once copper makes it out into the vineyard then the, there has been shown proof that the copper does create some complications in the cellar so Though we do spray the surrounding areas, the stuff that I'm spraying, especially for fungicide, if I see something, then I'm spraying something like a parasitic acid and uh, 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 what's it? Uh, something like an oxidase or sporoquel, where it's parasitic acid and forgetting the other chemical, um, wh which is very low, low harm and it doesn't have this, you know, very negative impact on the grapes. But it's, it's something I could spray the day before harvest, and it's still healthy to consume for us. Um, but yeah, it, it's a lot of figuring out and what we want to do forward. So we're certainly open-minded and you know continuing that dialogue with the grapes so we can figure out the right approach. I have another question or more. Sure. So are you finding a, a demand or a price bump for the for the uh, botanical wine versus non-botanical? Do, do consumers really care? To an extent, um, I had asked this at a meeting that we we're having um, in one of my case studies for my MBA, we we're talking about the conscious consumer and how is that affecting uh, producers. And I think people are always going to ask, where, do their, where does the fruit come from and how is it treated? And of course, like when I was at my undergrad at Texas State, one of the things I was so proud of is focusing on soil fertility, not this huge demand and being a cause to the Missouri River, or the Mississippi River dead zone, but to be the on the, on the other side of that coin. Um, so there has been, I would say for every 10 visits we have, I wanna say somewhere between seven to nine times of the 10, someone asks, do you spray Roundup? Do you spray this, do you spray that? And we're completely transparent. We say exactly what we do and in terms of pricing, it's hard to it's hard to do at the low end for the red wine. It's twenty seven dollars, but if something won best in class at San Francisco, which you know in the Midwest that's huge, right? So we would price those up. But then it's a little bit on the because of how laborious it is in general. I want to say the ethnobotanical is somewhere in between the thirty five dollar range versus the twenty seven for that purpose. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then also we have two wine club releases a year, one in the spring and one in the fall. And prior to that, we'd never really put Norton in to the wine club packages. But as a result of this, Norton has been making an appearance because we really want to share as because every every block, the east block, the center block, the west block. I mean, those three wines, four wines, because the ethanol potato could not be more different from each other, even though it's the same yeast, same process and everything else, so. I just have a curiosity, like the organic gardening, organic agriculture is pretty universal. Everybody knows that. But when you say ethanol bot botanical, does your client customers understand what you're talking about? Usually no. And then that's when uh, Jerry or, or uh, Usually that question gets asked when Jerry's in the format of a presentation. Um, now, mind you, I have a great bandwidth of everything that's going on, but those, you know, what he would say about the, the because he coined that term, I'm gonna let him define that. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it, uh, yeah, yeah. All right, any questions here? Let's use a microphone so that recorded version also has this conversation on. Um, I thought I heard you say during the takeaways that it was less labor and then at least slightly, if not more, better outcomes. And then when you were thinking about expanding, you wanted to be careful not to expand too fast. And I was wondering if there were specific downsides to it that you, or you just want to be careful about. Yeah, it's, it's certainly... The careful aspects um, with the sixty varietals. I, the other thing I didn't mention is in this area right here, in this area. So this is Cliff Amber's. A lot of those grape varietals don't even have names yet. Um, this section is also our seedling section. So with all the different, so we're we're exploring diversity. We're exploring with ex experimenting, but at the same time. The business model is it, it demands for a typicity. So if I make a red wine this way, it can only it should only get better. But if I'm going to abandon that red wine program to make a rosé, then it, it's counterproductive to the business model. But um, to your to your point, there certainly needs to be a approach of if we just cut off spraying completely, we can go from I don't know uh, ten tons to six tons, which uh, give us all a heart attack. Um, but I think in the interim, when we can slowly grow and we create this, you know, program of what we would need, I would hope that the entire West Block can be biodynamic, that we can expand to the rest of the vineyard. So that's, that's the hope. That's the approach. So the downside was it does at least uh, temporarily reduce production? Yes. Yeah. I think uh, 2020, we went from... 581 pounds, so like 486. This past year, we had a rough time in the vineyard. Uh, we had about half that. And it wasn't uh, biodynamic Norton or Wetumpka. It was the entirety of the vineyard. So 2022 is kind of like um, put an asterisk on that on that year for that case. Um, but yeah, the other, the other takeaway, I, I, thinking about it, you know, we want to continue. So right here, Kind of hard to tell. That's where our compost pile is. Um, I've been really interested to go into our irrigation system that's right here and implementing a sort of uh, fertigation type of thing where I can just go ahead and if I have uh, compost tea, I can just go ahead and streamline that into the irrigation. Uh, the only trouble with that is our irrigation line works great here, but this section's on that section can't be on, so we'd have to turn out. So logistically, we can make it work, um, but since that side of the vineyard, the the original, uh, the old vineyard, um, a lot of the irrigation is just there. There aren't any need for irrigation anymore, so it'd be difficult to kind of go back and turn the water on. But if it makes sense, then I think we should go ahead and try to continue that. So that's another thing. I don't know if compost is not necessarily, it might be a little more laborious to actually like scoop on the gator, drop in the vineyard versus streamlining that into the irrigation line. So I think that might be a route that, or a route that we're certainly looking at taking. Um, so 
looking at the property, it's very hard to tell, but do you have any experience of herbicide drift? Yes. So um, 2,4-D dicamba, that's certainly something that I saw back in Texas when I was making wine there as well as here. Uh, so you will see on the grapes, um, on the grape leaf, this sort of like stretch marks. It's almost to the point where, uh, it, it, imagine it being stretched to the point where it's less green and a little bit more white. So that's uh, one of the results we've had. Um, you can see in this section, this was taken, I think, two and a half years ago. So this section, a lot more dense. This section is still growing. Now we're at the point where it's pretty much all covered. But one of the things that we would see down the rows is as a result of 2,4-D and dicamba, the juvenile vines were having a tough time. They were just so stunted. They were stunted with their production. And that's something that wasn't great. And on top of that, with the, with the drift that we received, there's also the pregnant deer that are coming in and wanting to eat the, the juvenile uh, grapevines. So we did put up blue tubes, but yeah, drift is something we certainly get a decent number of.